Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Justin Essary. I'm an assistant professor of political science at Rice University. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. Uh, the International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speaker is Lana Atkinson from the University of New Mexico giving a talk entitled Data Quality, Professional Respondents, and Discontinuous Surveys, Issues of Engagement, Knowledge, and Satisficing. And I want to uh, point out that we're, we're conducting an experiment uh, today. Uh, we have a live audience to go along with our local audience, which I see the camera is now panning to show. Uh, but but if, you're, if you're watching remotely, uh, you can still uh, ask questions. Uh, the talk, the Lana's talk, will last between 30 to 40 minutes, after which point we'll take questions from both the live and remote audiences. Uh, you may call in to ask a question on the air at our toll-free call in line, which is 1-855-667-8287. That's 1-855-NO-STATS. Uh, you can email questions to methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Finally, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel. For our viewers outside the U.S. and who aren't local, we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure that we receive your questions immediately. A copy of the paper and slideshow that goes along with this presentation is available in the handouts box in your GoToWebinar window. And once the Q&A period begins, Lana is going to take her own questions uh, from the local audience, and I will flag her down to indicate uh, questions that are coming from the, the remote audience. So with that, Lana, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, first thing I want to do is thank Justin for uh, tolerating and indulging me in uh, setting up a different setup for the talk. I just really need to move, and I didn't feel that I could move at my desk in a way that would be successful for me. So we set this up, and I'm excited to be here. I'm very excited to be here to talk about survey research because I am very passionate about survey research. I'm so excited. And um, I am here to talk to you about what's happening in survey research. And one of my goals today is to stimulate your interest in survey research and to get you thinking about how the field is changing and what that means for us as uh, political scientists and social scientists. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, my collaborators at this point, Alex Adams, who's my graduate student, and Jeff Karp at the University of Exeter. I want to start by saying, what is an online panel? An online panel is a group of selected research participants who have agreed to provide information about their attitudes and behaviors over an extended period of time on a variety of different projects. Panel members are recruited into the panel randomly through telephone, through telephone surveys or address-based sampling. That's what GFK does for knowledge networks. And that's the most sophisticated method. Um, and in that case, um, they're recruited. They're, there's like a random uh, digit dial going on and, and uh, address-based sampling. And they recruit members to the panel through those efforts. More likely, most panels are created through ads on the web, uh, friends telling friends, or people like me who insist that their students become professional respondents so they can learn about survey research um, as a respondent. So panel members are essentially panel respondents. And that's something we haven't given enough thought to as we consider this new way of collecting data on individuals. So they're essentially panel respondents, even though they are not necessarily members of the same survey research design over time. Therefore, we need to think of them as members of discontinuous panels, and therefore they are subject to panel conditioning effects. Panel members receive rewards for their participation in surveys. Um, they receive airline points, they receive gift certificates, t-shirts, um, money, uh, gift certificates, money, as I guess I said gift certificates. Um, and so the definition of a professional is a person who is paid to undertake specialized sets of tasks and complete them for, for a fee. So these types of survey respondents, these panel members, are professional respondents. Online panels represent the sample frame of the potential respondents who can be recruited to participate in surveys. Online panel sample frames do not reflect the underlying population of study as a normal sample frame would, but are used to approximate a representative sample for any particular study through a variety of methods, including quota sampling, weighting, sometimes the weights can be very extreme, and in the most sophisticated sense, a sample map, uh, matching procedure with a theoretically derived probability sample 
from the uh, census, from the American Cons uh, Consumer Survey. And so they, they draw a virtual sample and then use their respondent pool to match that sample pool too. And then they use a combination of these factors to create a representative sample. It's important to recognize that online samples are not, consider, are not considered probability-based samples, online survey samples. People are selected into a survey or they're invited to participate in a particular survey, uh, recruited into that study based upon their demographic characteristics. Again, like they match the sample, the virtual sample, to their actual people in their file. Panel members are invited to participate at different rates because of demand and supply curves related to panel membership and survey population requests. Panel respondents res accept invitations at different rates based upon unknown factors. And panel respondents drop out or attrit from online panels at unknown rates and for unknown reasons. We really don't know a lot about, about those things at all. Importantly, there are important theoretical differences between these panels and traditional panels, traditional probability pan uh, samples that we've used in the past. Online panel surveys create a different incentive structure for respondents. The relationship between the professional respondent and the panel is one based on economic exchange, whereas in traditional surveys, methods relied upon social exchange theory to motivate and engage the respondent. The idea of social exchange is that respondents are giving something back to society. They're benefiting society through their responses, and that leads them to provide and motivates them to engage the survey. Economic exchange is a, is, a, is a, you know, unique exchange to that individual, right? They do the survey, they get the reward. Interestingly enough, you'd think that economic exchange would motivate and engage people more, but there's a, a large body of research actually in economics that shows that changing individual motivations from extrinsic to extrinsic causes a decline in performance. And sometimes that's cost, called the hidden cost of reward. So why do we care about that? Well, motivation is critical. It's critically important because respondents are expected to provide thoughtful and accurate answers, providing high-quality data for research. Motivation for rewards may lead to greater satisfying, that is just, you know, sort of going through the survey, but not in engaged ways. That is, they're not optimizing their answers, right? Because the goal is to complete a survey to get a reward, not to exchange social information that might benefit society. But there are other implications that we need to consider from the survey environment, particularly the fact that we have these potential for panel conditioning effects. They're members of the discontinuous panels. So we might see, for example, learning effects. Frequent topics might crystallize opinion or it might change opinion. Repeated surveys may heighten to respondents' mismatches between their attitudes and behaviors, which may lead them to change um, their behavior or remove any cognitive dissonance they have. Also, we know that surveys motivate people. Uh, it can create them, it's more likely they'll buy cars if they're asked about cars early on. Um, they're more likely to give money to charities. And they're more likely to vote. People who are in a survey early before the election are more likely to vote than people who are taking a survey after the survey. Um, so there are potential for learning or stimulating effects from the panel conditioning process. Long-term panel members, in particular, may have a particular taste for politics or for doing surveys in general. Um, I've tried to be a professional respondent, and I found that after a while it was impossible to do consumer surveys. I just didn't care whether I was going to buy jeans in the next six months and how many. I just, you know, I couldn't continue providing this kind of information, but I was really excited to do the political surveys. <laughs> so perhaps people have a different taste for different types of surveys. Therefore, attrition, either in particular types of surveys or just generally, may be an important factor in understanding differences in, a, in a responses across panel tenure. And we consider attrition to be a broad problem of panel conditioning. Once we consider survey respondents or, or panel online panel respondents in this way as professional survey respondents, as part of discontinuous surveys, it leads us to ask some really important questions. Do longer-term panel members have different characteristics than shorter-term panel members? Do more experienced online members differ in their response patterns and level of engagement from less experienced online panel members? Do online members differ from respondents selected in probability-based sampling designs? And what are the implications of using online uh, panels for data quality and total survey error? These are really important questions 
because there are really a lot of online panels and we're using them extensively. The CCS is a huge component of especially survey experiments, but also it's being used for inferential designs. The ANES has used Knowledge Networks, which is now GFK, and they've, they've had a number of designs over time that include um, online panels. And the GSS also has online panels. Federal government also is using online panels. So there are lots of places using this data, and we are beginning to use these data uh, a lot as well. We're publishing this data, and we're making inferences, population-based inferences with these data. But we haven't really sort of looked at these data to understand the boundaries or what the potential errors are in these data. So I've talked a lot about professional respondents. So what is a professional respondent, right? We've sort of defined it, but let's take a look at one. I don't have a picture, but I have something that they said. So here's an example of a professional uh, respondent. This is in the survey that we're going to look at, the GSS, uh, the EGSS, the uh, Evaluation of Government and Social Study survey. And this was a, the respondent was asked, thinking about this topic, and it was a gun control issue, do you have anything you want to share? And the respondent said, do you happen to have ties to the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research? Your folksy question style is very distinctive and very much reminds me of ISR. For the record, I like it. This is clearly a professional respondent. They actually can identify different survey houses and different styles within in survey houses, and they, they actually have an affect for it. They actually feel something for it. This is an of a professional respondent. Previous research on this question has found little evidence of panel tenure affecting response patterns. However, this research has been fairly atheoretical by placing a dummy variable in for panel tenure and seeing if it affects the direction and the magnitude of respondents' attitudes and behaviors. But that assumes that panel tenure would move individual opinion in a single direction, which doesn't really make sense. Therefore, we really consider for the first time the implications of our theory regarding panel conditioning effects to identify what the appropriate hypotheses should be. So first, <clears throat> we're going to look for indirect evidence of panel conditioning effects. The survey respondents who take more surveys are inherently different from those who take less surveys. So if we find evidence that demographic variables are related to panel tenure, we have some initial evidence to support our theory. Rewards may also play a role in survey retention and survey acceptance. Some panel members in the GFK panels are given internet connection when they don't have it, because remember, they use address-based sampling and phones to find people in their panel, and then they give them access to the internet when they don't have it. Now, given our theory about extrinsic and intrinsic rewards, we might expect those people who are getting additional rewards um, to work less. At least that would be consistent uh, with that hypothesis, that theory. Um, our second hypothesis has to do with survey duration, um, sort of a learning effect. We expect people who've been doing surveys a lot longer uh, to be able to do them more quickly. Um, it also could be the case that you just want to, you know, zoom through your survey to get your rewards, right? So that could be more, you know, maybe as you get more tenure, you're more likely to do that as well. We also expect people to learn because they are part of a long-term discontinuous panel and we expect them to learn um, about information. There are only so many political questions and so if you're doing political surveys, you're going to get these same kind of questions over and over again. So we think that as panel tenure increases, political knowledge will also increase. Finally, our last has hypothesis has to do with non-differentiation. Non-differentiation is also known as straight lining. The definition of, um, of non-differentiation uh, is when respondents fail to differentiate between the items with their answers by giving identical responses to all items using the same response scale. This is a very, very strong form of satisficing. Right? You're not engaged in the process at all. You're just marking down the survey. Here's an example of non-differentiation. And you can see that this person said strongly agree to all of the categories. I stole this from uh, Qualtrics, you can see, because the top one is Qualtrics is awesome. <laughs> and, uh, but the bottom one is I dislike my friends. And uh, <laughs> um, so you can see that, that you wouldn't say strongly agree to all of these, even if you agreed that Qualtrics was awesome. 
So this is a strong form of satisficing, and, and you could do it along any one of these um, dimensions. But people are not differentiating, they're not engaged, and they're not motivated. So our hypothesis is that online panels, online panel members are more likely to engage in greater levels of non-differentiation than respondents in probability-based surveys, regardless of their survey mode. Right? So regardless of whether it's phone or, or in person or um, um, some other method, it doesn't matter. Online panel members, they're going to satisfy us more than people who are part of regular one-shot cross-sectional designs. Um, and we think that panel members with less tenure will engage in non-differentiation more than panel members with um, more tenure. And why do we think that? We think the panel members who have less tenure are less experienced and they've learned less. So they're more, they're more likely to engage the survey at a different level, whereas people who have stayed in the process a long time have actually learned and crystallized their opinions more and more quickly go, oh yeah, I've seen that question before. I know how to answer that. I've done it before. Um, so those are our hypotheses. The data source, we used the first publicly available data that provided information on the number of surveys that people are completing in these online panels. And this was the ANES 2010 through 12 Evaluations of Government and Social Studies Survey. It was administered by Knowledge Networks, um, who does the random sampling at the beginning. So some people who are concerned of that might, uh, uh, that, that makes them a, a sort of a stronger organization, a stronger design, a stronger research design. Um, we combine all of the four cross-sections, October 2010, two in 2011, and one in 2012, um, to have enough respondents, especially enough new respondents in the file. And we also compare some of this to the ANES 2008 major panel and ANES cumulative file. <coughs> so um, our research design is basically uh, what you might, well, what, uh, a design, sorry, a design you might want to do um, is you might want to attempt to follow specific panel members over the long term to identify panel conditioning effects. And I'd like to point out that I have a paper with Alex Adams on that thing where we've used uh, the TAPS data, the, the TAPS data that WashU produces to look at that effect. Um, but we suggest that this is problematic in these types of studies because respondents are experiencing different types of surveys and responding to them at different rates. So panel conditioning is not happening consistently in these kinds of designs across panel members. Therefore, we can never know the exact nature of any particular respondent's uh, previous experience. So therefore, we measure it with the total number of surveys taken in the panel by the respondent at the time of the survey. And that's a good proxy for their experience as professional respondents. This is a really good measure because we can compare respondents who have taken many surveys with those who have taken fewer surveys. This is a really good measure because it is potentially available in these types of designs to help researchers identify and control for discontinuous panel effects. This is something that the survey house could provide everyone. Also, it's a continuous measure which allows us to consider panel conditioning effects without making a priori assumptions about how many completed surveys are required to be a prof professional respondent. Our main independent variable then is this continuous number of surveys that's completed by the respondent. It's highly reliable because it's provided by the survey research firm, GFK, or Knowledge Networks at the time. There are no more, interestingly enough, uh, no more than 120 respondents in each version, each because each is a separate cross-section of the EGGS with 25 or less surveys. The mean is over 150, and maximum is over 700. These people are taking a lot of surveys, um, and it's over 900 in section in the uh, in the cross sections for three and four. So let's just take a look at that with a, a box and whiskers uh, plot, because I think this is pretty shocking at first to a lot of people, just to realize how many surveys these individuals are taken. And you can see on our box and whis uh, whiskers plot that the mean is uh, well over 150 for the first cross section, and it goes almost out to 600 in terms of <clears throat> the number of taken. When we look at the ANES and the, uh, the time series in 2012, you can see that uh, the mean is 180. And uh, you know we're out there at 600, and if we look at the tail, there's actually some respondents who've taken over 1,000 surveys. We recontacted these respondents in the ANES in 2013, and I love, I love this. 
Can I do that? <laughs> you can see how it changes, um, right? But it, it, it's, it's over 200 a year later, right? Those same people went from a mean of 180 to a mean of, you know, two, 280 or something like that, right? So it's very high. So people are taking a lot of surveys. We need to be thinking about panel conditioning effects and other potential um, errors in this, in this environment. What are the total survey errors we need to think about in this environment? So our dependent variable, well, the first thing we're going to do is look at panel tenure, which is the number of surveys completed, and um, um, look at how demographics play into that. Uh, the second thing is we're going to look at the duration. How long did it take them to, to complete the survey? Um, and that's, again, highly reliable, provided to us by knowledge networks. We look at political knowledge in two different ways. We look at it using a straight political knowledge question um, where we know who controlled the House, Senate, and the job of Nancy Pelosi. Um, and that is only in one of the cross-sections. So you know, we don't have very many respondents at the lower end. So we also have one question that was repeated across all of the cross-sections, and that's whether or not uh, you had to place the, the parties on an ideological scale. And so if they knew that the Democrats were to the left of the um, uh, Republicans, we scored that as a correct answer. And then the last one is non-differentiation, and we define non-differentiation when a respondent sees their ideology, the Democratic Party ideology, and the Republican Party on the same seven-point ideological scale. So we define that seems very unlikely that you would see all of those in the same ideological position, and so we're going to define that as non-differentiation. We our models, we all the usual suspects, age, gender, a race, uh, white, we control for being white, education, household income, marital status, um, employment, whether they have internet access provided by uh, knowledge networks, their party identification, their political interest, and which cross-section of the survey uh, they were in. The results for the first question, which is about uh, survey tenure, where we're looking at number of surveys completed as the um, the dependent variable, we find there are effects, right? We wouldn't necessarily expect to see um, people be in the panel longer or less time, but we do see that that is actually the case. People who are older are in the um, uh, have completed more surveys. People with le higher education have completed less surveys. Um, people, let's see, uh, it's hard for me to actually see it from here. <laughs> um, uh, the important one to take away is the internet access one which shows that people who uh, had extra internet access or were given internet access access did on average, I think it's about 56 um, less surveys on average than other people. Okay, so we do find at least indirect effects that there's something different about being a panel member, that different panel members take different amounts of surveys. Um, so here is our um, <clears throat> looking at survey duration. The total number of surveys completed is on the bottom. So as the surveys increase, the survey duration time decreases, as expected. If we think about what those results mean, a five-minute decline in survey durations from the lowest number of surveys completed to the highest number of surveys completed is uh, 35.2 um, minutes to 29, well, basically 30 minutes, so about a five-minute difference. At the 10th uh, percentile and the 90th percentile, which is 31 completes, and 403 completed surveys, we see a decline of about two minutes. And at the 25th and the 75th percentile, which represents 63 completes and 260 uh, completes, um, we see a decline about of, a, of, of a minute. So this is very robust um, in the data. When we look at knowledge, we see a clear effect of political knowledge. Um, the longer you're in the survey, the more likely you are to realize that uh, the Democratic Party is to the left of the Republican Party, and likewise, you're very much likely to um, ha know all, all three answers correctly, all three political knowledge correctly, the longer you've been um, in the survey. Um, recall, non-differentiation is when a respondent doesn't differentiate between answers and chooses the same response for each item, and in our case, that's choosing their ideological placement, the ideological placement of the Democratic Party, and the ideological uh, position of the Republican Party. Um, Non-differentiation does exactly what we see. The longer you've been in the panel, um, the more likely you are to differentiate, the more likely you are to see differences between uh, the parties and yourself. 
interesting when we think about how this compares across uh, modes, when we look at those same exact questions using the face-to-face -face survey, um, in 2008, we see that uh, differentiation that 97% of people differentiated and only 3% did not differentiate. And if we look at the cumulative ANES over time, we can see that that's consistent, that only about 3% of the people can't differentiate at least one of those actors themselves, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, as different from each other. But in the EGSS, where we have all these online panel members, non-differentiation is a five-fold increase. Right? It's at 16% versus 84%. So that's a really big difference in terms of non-differentiation and something we need to think about. <clears throat> Implications for non-differentiation. Um, just, just for interest, there aren't many uh, data points in the survey that are repeated. Remember, they're each four separate cross-sections. But there are about eight questions that are repeated over each, uh, political questions that are repeated over each uh, each cross-section. So I just threw in non-differentiation using all my same model controls and then I threw non-differentiation in there to see if that predicted any of these um, any of these variables. And these are like past economic evaluations, uh, future economic evaluations, presidential approval, uh, internal political efficacy and support for the Tea Party. And you know three of them actually showed significant effects. And um, interestingly enough, they were all sort of they were all negative. So it seems that I don't know if these people are responding just early in the survey. You know, again, they're satisficers, so maybe they're just selecting one of the first responses consistently, and that's um, making them seem um, less internally efficacious, uh, less likely um, to see the economy as positive, et cetera. So there could be important implications of this. I this isn't. A, it says actually in the paper, this is something I threw in to sort of see what the effect is being, and stimulate some discussion about it. Also could be that there's a taste for politics. If you look at the uh, 2012 um, ANES and you compare the face-to-face -face with the online panelists, you find that the face-to-face -face respondents reported voting in a primary or caucus at 26%, but the web um, panelists at 38%, a really big difference, which sort of suggests they're more active um, audience, and also if you look at the 2012 ANES, you see that they're much more polarized, suggesting that some of the web, um, uh, that there may be crystallization of opinion, there seem to be more certain. Um, so what are the implications and normative issues? Well, panel tenure may matter for data quality. Greater satisficing is a potential threat to surveys, which may lead to increased total survey error. People who are in panels longer may have a particular taste for politics. Um, that may affect our understanding of political behavior and attitudes and relationships between variables. The political sophistication results, the political knowledge results, are particularly troubling given its importance as both a mediating and a moderating variable for substantive questions. And these data are used frequently for experiments, especially for survey experiments. And I think this research suggests that we may want to balance groups on panel tenure in addition to demographics. It may be important for us to think about panel tenure as a balanced component in our survey research, uh, our survey research experiments. Finally, our results raise questions about the growing use of these data. But survey researchers make trade-offs all of the time between design and error. That's what we do. We just need to know more information about what type of error is in these designs and how we deal with it. Therefore, this is a, always a call for, for more research. Um, Importantly, the differences in the ANES 2012 between the online panel and the face-to-face -face respondents are sometimes quite stark and something we need to think about. Also, in the recent British election and the 2014 midterm, polls in both countries were, were not very good. Predictions were quite off, especially in the UK. Um, both kinds of polls, polls that use online panel as members, polls that use traditional probability sampling. I mean, Probability sampling has a huge set of its own problems because you know response rates are so low, you know, usually under 10%, um, sometimes under 5%. What does that mean? Can we really say that that is a random sample at that point? Um, so our polls are in crisis. Um, the future is certainly here. It's here to stay. We're going to have online polls, but we need to be thinking about them and thinking about the total survey error and what that means. So you can see that. I need you, all of you, this great community of methodologists um, around the world right now um, to think about survey research and to uh, you know, contribute 
to understanding and, and our growth in knowledge in this very important field for political science. So I hope that I have today stimulated um, your excitement to opening up the ANES or some other uh, publicly available survey data set and to take a look at what's going on in the survey research world. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Lana, for that presentation. We already have some questions coming in from the online audience. So uh, before I get to those, uh, a couple of things. Uh, if you'd like to uh, ask a question in your, um, in your local, you should go up to the microphone so that everyone can hear you. If you'd like to ask a question and you're remotely located, you can call in uh, at 1-855-667-8287. That's 1-855-NO-STATS. Uh, you can email a question at methods.colloquium at gmail.com. Finally, you can ask a question using the GoToWebinar Ask Question box that appears on the GoToWebinar control panel. For our viewers outside the United States, we recommend using the Ask Question box to ensure we receive your questions immediately. And if you don't mind, Lana, I'm going to just start rolling off some of the questions that were coming in from the online audience. Um, and you can let me know if there's a local questioner that you want to take a question from as well. Sure. So uh, this question comes from Thomas Ball. Uh, GFK claims to have the only nationally representative probability online panel. While the panel taken as a whole may be, rep may be a representative probability sample, doesn't that, does that generalize to specific studies where survey participation may not, be, may not result in a balanced sample? Would the sample participating in a specific study still be a probability sample? Uh, certainly GF claim, GFK would make the claim that it is, and the APOR community has accepted GFK and their sampling as a better methodology for recruiting panel respondents. So it's seen as sort of uh, resolving some of the issues that are in uh, uh, other non-panels uh, non that don't engage in that kind of uh, uh, recruitment for their panel. Um, so I think it's a sort of an open question, what are the implications of that? Uh, for any particular research design. Certainly all the people who are in their panel are, are you know, selected on a probability basis. Um, and they do get deference for that. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's an open question. Um, another question from uh, Joe Murphy. Uh, he says, thanks for a fascinating presentation. Do you have thoughts on how to mitigate non-differentiation amongst professional panelists in the survey design? Are there things we can uh, do uh, or things we can improve in surveys to reduce the likelihood of this happening in the first place? Yes, yeah, so in the, EG, um, in the EGGS, what they did is they created the grids, which you know, really encourages satisficing. But to make, this, uh, to make it more similar to the face-to-face -face in the 2012 design, what they did is they, they gave the respondents each, um, each question individually, so they didn't get a whole grid. Um, like they would in the face-to-face -face version, you'd have each question asked individually. And so that did reduce the amount of non-differentiation um, in the 2012 study. Uh, there's, a, there's a question um, from uh, QJ Yao, and it, it actually it matches something that I'm wondering about. So um, uh, he asks, or I, actually I don't know, it's he or she, but uh, the person asks, uh, have people found out a way to compile a representative online samples is the question. but a related question to that is, I know that there are, um, you know, the, I don't know, is it still called YouGov? The, the erstwhile YouGov, it's merged several times now. Um, you got yeah, essentially claims that although their internet-based samples are not, obviously not representative, they can re-weight them, right? They can, I can, I can figure out what the population looks like, I can figure out what the, popula what the sample looks like, and then I can re-weight the responses to fix them. Is that something that's going to uh, potentially fix uh, the the problems that you're pointing out? You know, I think I mean reweighting is a I mean it's a common procedure in doing this. I mean you've got quotas and you've got weighting and then you've got the matching techniques and you know often all three of these are are used at some level, right? All three of these are used to create the online sample. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost track of where I was. What was the specific question about the way? Does it solve the problem? The weighting yeah. does, um, you know, the thing about, so this is very interesting because if you look at some of the weighting, means are moving an awful lot. And, you know, I've always thought of that as a, a potential red flag when you weight your data and your means move substantially. 
um, you know, that that sort of becomes worrisome. Uh, waiting is, is one step. I, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it can fix a sample that is um, not representative. I was, not uh, that doesn't have that. To follow up with this, so there, there are two potential issues that I see. Issue A is demographic non-representativeness. Issue B is something about being a panelist changes who you are. And then those two things could interact. So most of the talk I've heard other, before today was about issue one, right? There are too many old people, too many white people, whatever, in our sample. And you pointed out that professional samples do have that issue. But then there's this other issue of professionalization. So is this, um, to what extent can we fix this with modeling, right? We can model the process by which panel participation changes responses and then extract that from the, from the answers. Is it modelable? I don't know yet. I don't think we know yet. I mean, yeah, I think the answer should be that it should be. We should be able to figure out what the error is and provide models that deal with that. And I think this is a first step at trying to think at how you might do that when you have ongoing discontinuous panels. And at least we have this one measure that tells us about um, you know, how long people have been in the panel and how many experiences they've had. And so that's, it's a crude measure, but at least it's a proxy for their experiences. And so you know, how can we use that to potentially adjust um, adjust information. I think that the most troubling um, concern is things like learning about political knowledge because that is such an important, um, you know, that's so important to our models and understanding political behavior that if people are learning, um, you know, that may really affect our relationships in ways that we haven't considered yet. And I don't know how to fix that one. Can we weight people's political knowledge? Can we weight that down? Do we have expectations? But that has effects on how they, you know, how they do the rest of the survey, right? How they think about their own certainty of opinion um, when they're faced with questions again and again. Um, th there are tons of questions coming in. Do we? Are there, are there any local questions that we, we should address before I, because I could just yeah. keep going. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to keep going. I don't know if you guys, did, I'm happy to, would you guys, do you have any questions? No, they said go ahead. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead then. So um, this comes from uh, Thomas Leeper. Um, uh, given current trends, we will presumably just run out of survey respondents at some point. <laughs> uh, what, what do we do if we ever get to the, uh, to the point oh, where funny. essentially there are only professional respondents and there are few, if any, other respondents who are willing to be interviewed? And so the point of this is to try to tra evaluate trade-offs between um, different methodologies in other words, what have we gained or lost by moving progressively from probabilistic phone surveys to non-probabilistic uh, um, other kinds of surveys? Um, well, you know, I, I think there's always going to be people left who aren't participating in surveys who you can access. Um, I actually do online surveys as well, but I do them in a probability-based method where I do mixed, uh, mixed, uh, a, a mixed design. So I send out uh, postcards to voters, and then I ask them to go online and take, this, take the survey. So that's a probability-based method, right? I mean, I'm doing address, basically. Uh, I use the voter registration file, and so I take a random sample of voters. I send out a postcard, and I drive people to the web, or I have them do mail surveys. So I can still do probability-based online surveys. Um, I just have to do them a different way. I, c I can do them differently than online samples. I, I don't think we're, you know, I, I think that we're always going to have available people who are not part of uh, online surveys to ask questions about. So that's not going to be our only, they're not going to be the only people left, which I think was the beginning of that question, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess the, the spirit of that is at a certain point, uh, of course, the internet is big and population is big, but at a certain point, there there are just a finite number of people who are willing to participate in this stuff. Yeah. And there there are some of those you haven't reached yet, right? Because you don't have their email address or whatever. But as our information gets sort of as we get more and more centralized in terms of our databases, at a certain point, you're just basically asking everyone who's willing to take a survey, right? So you're you have the population of people who are willing to take a survey. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. everyone else is not going to, no matter what you do, you're not going to take your survey. Yeah, sort of like not voters and non-voters, sort of, uh, eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know what, that, 
I, you know, I don't know how to answer that question, actually, because that's a pretty big what if question. How is that going to impact our, I, I, don't, I don't know. That's really, <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, there's, a, there's a related question here, and I was trying to mix them uh, together, but I'll, I'll just ask this other question. This comes from Thomas Ball. Um, so 40 years ago, most market research was telephone-based. Mm -hmm. uh, that was 40 years ago. 20 years ago, uh, 80 to 90 percent of market research was based on mall intercepts. Uh, today, 89 percent of research is drawn from online samples. And the cost effectiveness is, of online samples is driving this. Is it possible, and I would add advisable, to do some sort of comparative study like yeah. a multi-trait, multi-methods approach, and then the sort of this, this ties in with the previous question in the sense of what are we gaining or losing by changing our methods from sort of mm -hmm. confronting people on the street or in the telephone where they may be less likely to tell us go away versus uh, sending them an email or, or confronting them in some other um, uh, sort of easier to brush off environment. Yeah, I think we really need to look at this uh, this sort of motivation question and think about a design that would take into a consideration. I mean, there's a lot of MTurk studies. There are now Facebook studies. There are uh, you know these quota sampling um, being done with Qualtrics. People getting their own you know GFK surveys. So there are lots of different ways that we're doing things. Do all of these different methods provide the same results? Um, you know, I actually had a question. I, I gave this talk at the Visions and Methodology question, uh, um, conference, and uh, you know, a person actually said that they've done the same experiment in different formats, and they get very different responses. They get very different outcomes. Well, you know, why is that? It's probably not the experiment isn't giving the right, you know, conditioning. It has something to do with the motivation and engagement of the respondent. So I think what we need to focus on is, you know. You know, if we're going to have professional respondents, maybe we need to train them to be professionals. What does it mean to be a competent survey respondent? Right? What does it mean to be a professional respondent? It means you're engaged in the survey. It means you're motivated to the answers, the questions in a real, sincere way and to do it responsibly. We don't really educate anyone on how to take a survey ever. There is no training to be a first time survey respondent. You sign up and you start taking surveys. In fact, it's just expected that you know how to take surveys well, I guess because you've been taking standardized tests your entire life. Right? Because there no there is no and you know we put a question um, most recently on um, the CCES where we asked one of the questions we did the uh, you know here, read this question. We want to know if you're paying attention, so please answer. Uh, we asked them to answer other and write in, I read it, right? I read what we asked them to read. I read it. So only 60% uh, of the people actually followed the instructions on our CCS survey, right? I mean, 40% of the people answered the question as if it was a real question, right? It said, it said, um, you know, what, what campaign activities did you participate in? And so they checked off as many as they wanted, but if they read the rest of the directions, it said, we're just checking on you. <laughs> so another thing that we might have to do is actually put in a lot of checks, right? So maybe one re resolution would be, as part of our surveys design, we actually have checks. Because the real, the real difference in the changes is that prior to now, we had interviewer-driven surveys. And now we have respondent-driven surveys. When you have interviewer-driven surveys, you can see how the person is engaged. We can ask the interviewer afterwards, how knowledgeable were they? Did they pay attention? So we can have um, information on that survey environment. But we know nothing about how surveys are done in a respondent-driven environment. right? We don't know what's going on in that environment. And that's really changed. The choice of the respondent has changed the world of survey research most drastically. So we may need these internal checks, right? Are you actually paying attention? And then poke them. And then if they're not, then we don't pay them. Well, right? related, we don't give them the reward. Related to that, is there, this is a question that follows up on that from, from Lisa Bryant. Is there a point at which you just <laughs> kick people out for, for being too professional? Um, in, you know, are there some, is there some sort of limit where you say, you've been too socialized? Into, into a survey, and so your response is no longer valued or valuable to us. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I supposedly I understand that like the uh, Polymetrics and YouGov that they do spend some amount of time at least looking for survey respondents who are not engaged, um, respondents who are finishing surveys in relatively little time. So they seem to be looking for respondents who are not engaged as opposed to respondents or who are too professional and too engaged, I guess. Um, but but we should think about both aspects because yeah, maybe you are. Um, maybe you are too professional. I, I'm not. I, yeah, I, we we should look at both ends. And the problem is we haven't looked at it at all. Uh, this question comes from uh, Ed Schneider. Uh, I'd love to believe that being a professional respondent leads to political learning. I doubt it. <laughs> what evidence do you have that increased reporting of participation is not just like over-reporting of having voted? Uh, what these respondents could have learned is that unless they said something, or I'm sorry, unless they did something, they would be in ineligible and thus not paid or rewarded. Well, um, in another paper with Alex Adams uh, that we presented at a WashU conference on survey uh, research last year, um, we found following the same individuals over time, so we could control for the problem of attrition in our design, we found that people learned that they answered more political knowledge questions you know, when they were at the ninth survey than when they were at the first survey. Um, there's other research out there that suggests people learn um, from, from surveys, from taking surveys. And so they're not just learning that they have to fill in an answer, they're actually getting the answers correct and they're not the same questions over and over? You're, no, they're, yeah, and this is well, you know, this is well thought of in survey research because you're stimulating. I mean, you can't, you know, you're talking to people about politics. So if I talk to you and I ask you a question about Nancy Pelosi, is she the House? You know, what is what does she do in the House, or what you know, what does she do? I guess as a political leader, um, you know, you're gonna maybe you don't know the first time, but maybe then you're attentive and suddenly you hear her name across the TV, or you know, you see it in print and you go, oh, that's what she does. Right, and so you know you're you're stimulated by the survey experience, cognitively to think about the subjects that you're being asked about. And if you you know you, there's only so many questions you can ask about politics, um, and about political knowledge. So um, you know there's going to be learning and stimulation of interest over time. Uh, I'm going to open it up to the the uh, local audience. To, we have about ten minutes left. Um, so are there local questions that you'd like to take or you'd like to ask? No. <laughs> are there any more questions at your end? Yeah, no, oh, Jessica no. has a question. We're, we're out of questions. Yeah, we have a question. Um, hi, my name is Jessica Jones. Um, I have a question about attrition. So what do we know at this point about the difference in uh, your sort of standard survey participant who's in a panel study in a non-online environment or not in this panel, this online panel environment, and the reasons that you know they tend to drop out of the study versus someone who drops out in this online panel environment? Do we know anything about the differences in those processes at we this do point? Not. We do not know. I mean, we don't really know that much about why people attrit. I mean, it's really interesting because um, in these long-term panels, like the American Panel Survey and USC has one, in these long-term panels, you know, the invitations go out, and then people respond, and sometimes they don't respond, and then the next time the invitation goes out, and then the person who didn't respond last time, then they respond this time. So we don't know, you know, it's personal events in people's lives causing them, and then eventually, you know, people just drop out. And so what they're doing with these long-term panels is they're freshening them. They create a whole new uh, fresh respondents that they put in later in the panel. Um, maybe, you know, you go through and you go, oh, you know, we've lost enough panel members that we need to refresh our sample. And so then they refresh it, and then those people start it, you know, they're at T1. And then they start over, and the whole cycle starts again. So we don't really know about what causes people um, to, you know, stay in for the long term, or is it interest? If it's interest, it's particularly troubling in terms of why you stay in, because that's likely to have greater effects on relationships, right? In, in terms of our models. Um, but those are really important questions that we need to be <laughs> need to be asking and, and thinking about. Lana, you know, you're talking about surveys, uh, but psychology experiments and economic laboratory experiments typically have subject pools. And my own experience with economic behavioral experiments is 
uh, you see a lot of the same people a lot uh, because you're paying them, right? You're giving them, you know, it's if you're, you're, usually it's undergraduates, and you're giving them twenty bucks, which you know, if you're eighteen or nineteen or twenty, that's real money. Um, and so you see a lot of them, and I'm wondering, um, is there any linkage between what you're studying and the use of, you know, sort of crypto professional laboratory rats, uh, laboratory subjects? I think you're absolutely right. They should be part of the pool. A uh, lot of a lot of universities have these um, experimental pools of subjects that they're pooling on, and uh, talking to researchers across the country about those pools, the people in them and the quality of the respondent is sometimes not very high. Um, and often, you know, it's interesting you say they're paid because often what I've been told is they're required to do it as part of class credit. For which science, may, that's true. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a disciplinary divide there. Right, so, the economists, of course. <laughs> right, economists pay. And political scientists who wish they were economists like me, we're pay, well, we, we pay. And uh, uh, political scientists who wish they were psychologists typically require their students to, uh, to participate. To give credit. I mean, and I wonder what the different result is. You know, I mean, if you have an incentive of credit versus an incentive of money, do you see a difference in motivation and engagement? Um, you know, we need to do, I agree, we need to do these experiments. We need to do experiments looking at different outcomes, the same research design across different types of subject pools, MTurk, uh, you know, GFK, all these Qualtrics, all these different online panels, um, and see, you know, where, you know, where these markers are, what, what causes, um, you know, what causes people to stay motivated, engaged, and what are the implications of that for uh, research outcomes. Have you read a, um, seen a book called uh, Not Just for the Money by Bruno Fry? I have not. Uh, it's, a, it's a theory and some, evidence, some experimental evidence about the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic incentives and in behavioral experiments. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think it would be really interesting to, it's related to some of the things yes. you're claiming about and it might give you some additional evidence. Thank you. Um, I'm a, there's one more question and then we'll probably uh, cut it off uh, for time reasons. So this comes from Thomas Leeper. Uh, given the theory about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation for survey participation, do you think it is possible to create a panel built around non-monetary incentives that would be able to sustain respondent participation over the long term? Hmm. Wonder what the long term is there. Um, you know, I think no matter. Yeah, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, but I think people would drop out uh, after you know relatively. I don't know. What's the long term? Um, what's the you know, I can imagine specific, like if you're thinking of a big cross-section of the public, I think that would be hard to motivate them to stay in a panel for non-monetary reasons or non-maybe economic reasons. Um, but on the other hand, I can imagine specific pools that could have very interesting reasons for wanting to stay in it, say health. You can imagine people who have particular health problems who could be part of pools that be surveyed about what's going on with them. And we haven't thought of creating sample frames in that way. Um, that would be very interesting, though. I mean, you could create special groups of people where the social side, the social exchange side of the theory um, was very strong and successful. I think that would be uh, figuring out, nailing down exactly what that would look like is probably going to be an important thing to do. Um, because it's very easy to, and it, I, I don't have any trouble thinking of what an extrinsic incentive looks like. It's cash or something free, but an in, you know developing an intrinsic incentive is that's I don't, you know nothing occurs to me in you know immediately. Um, Other than but, helping society. Yeah, which, <laughs> which is benefits of your population, right? I mean, if you're, I mean, you could imagine this for like health. It seems like you could imagine this like for health, particularly for health problems. You could create a pool of respondents who have a particular type of cancer, for example, or something like that. And, you know, they have intrinsic reasons to help all of the other people who are experiencing the same um, experience, right? And, you know, you could do surveys on them, and that could be very, you could pull from that base, that population base, um, and that could be very intrinsically motivated to, to engage at that level for those kinds of reasons. Although, like but you I, said, the, there's probably a link between their motivation and their opinion, right? So you're yeah, and whether it's generalizable outside of that, that's going to be the the really you know I was thinking of how do you intrinsically motivate someone where it doesn't actually cause their opinion to change, right? Mm. They, 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 you know, <clears throat> once you ask a question, I mean, I think you know, once you've done this, you, you're always changing people, right? I mean, that's there's always that effect. 
Well, um, we're, we're about out of time, so I want to thank uh, Dr. Atkinson for giving a very interesting presentation and for a very successful uh, live audience experiment. <laughs> um, uh, this is the last talk in the fall schedule for a research presentation, so thanks to everyone for, for attending uh, all fall. We'll be back in January with another full schedule of interesting talks and roundtable discussions, and you can go to our website, www.methods-colloquium.com, to see the schedule for the spring. Uh, thanks, everyone, and I'll see you uh, next semester. Thank you, Lana. Thank you. Wow.